Okay, um, can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, right. I'll start off with, with who I am. Um, my name is Ian Barwick. I've been using, I'm British, I lived in Germany for 15 years, and I've lived, the last six years I've been living in Japan. Uh, I've been using Postgres pro professionally, continuously since 2001. You may have seen my name on the mailing list now and then. However, this is a Till last year, I'd actually never ever met anyone from any part of the Postgres community. Um, this is my second PGCon ever. Um, now, <coughs> since April, I've been I've had the pleasure of um, working for Second Quadrant. Um, in this talk, I'll be talking about my previous job, which was working in Japan for a finance company um, doing the migration on the stock exchange. Um, you know, so the agenda, um, when I was putting this talk together, I thought it might be a little bit on the boring side if, if I just talk about um, Oracle. Um, I was thinking about um, thinking back when I started, the reason why I found Postgres in the first place was because um, when I started off back in 2001, my first task was to migrate Oracle database, so I'll go into that a little bit, um, just to show that Postgres, um, even back then, it was um, pretty awesome. Um, then I'll talk about the um, stock exchange migration. Um, now, if you think back to 2001, um, it was the era of the dot-com boom. Um, there were all kinds of companies creating all kinds of nebulous products, um, trying to make money off that. A bit like now, but with um, worse internet connections. Um, at the time, I was working in Germany for a company called Academie DE, which was um, Germany's first online uh, e-learning e provider. Um, now, this was kind of like, they started off like many companies at the time, the dot-com boom with venture capital, grants, that kind of financing. It was early days of the internet. No one knew what they were doing as far as websites uh, went, so they were just throwing boatloads of money at um, programmers and seeing what stuck. And suddenly, 2001 came. Uh, the money runs out. You need to make a profit or at least not make a loss. And they started cutting back, and suddenly I found myself as part of a very small in, um, IT team and the bosses were looking around, where can we save money? Oh, we've got an Oracle database. Um, let's get rid of that. Um, Ian, can you migrate that to MySQL? And I said, yeah, at the time I was quite, um, didn't really know much about databases. I said, yeah, sure, no problem, let's do it. Um, so I started looking at MySQL, and at the time MySQL, it was the open source database. Everyone um, loved it. Yeah, I kind of had this image of it. It would be like this, but when I looked into it, um, this was what I found. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, I started, try, um, um, I started migrating the Oracle schema, which is full of things like foreign keys, procedures, transactions, and looking at my as well, I thought, no, this is not going to work. Um, so, let's skip that one. Um, I was looking around for options at the time. There wasn't really much in the, as far as open source databases went. I mean, there was MSQL, which was pretty much um, on the way out. There was um, Interbase Firebird, which had just been open source, hadn't been released as Firebird. Um, it wasn't, you know, we weren't sure what the future was, and I started hearing about this um, database with a funny name called PostgreSQL or something. People were saying, you know, it's um, it's good, but it's kind of slow. It has this vacuum thing, which makes it difficult to work with. But I checked out any anyway, um, and it seemed to have all the prerequisites which we needed at the time, um, except the, um, it was actually a, bit, a little bit on the slow side in the, vac the vacuum thing, um, which was a problem, because um, uh, this migration, the, um, system was supposed to be reorganized so the database would be found in the website and obviously you, d you don't want your website to be um, slowed down by the database if it's vacuuming or anything like that. So I, um, 2001 I sent an email to the Postgres mailing list um, with some questions about that and I got some very useful replies. Um, I think Tom Lane, also from Tom Lane. Um, which gave me the confidence to actually move forward with, it, with the migration. Um, actually, um, <coughs> um, 
what I was able to do, do at the time to get around the whole um, vacuum issue was um, I wrote a very simple um, trigger-based replication system which replicated those tables which were necessary for the website to work so people could you know, register, sign up, make payments. Um, it would replicate that data to um, MySQL, which was a known qu quantity because it, um, even it wasn't so reliable. Um, yeah, and that, that process actually, that I was actually able to do that with Postgres at the time. It um, impressed me a lot, uh, very much. And um, yeah, since then I've been using Postgres pretty much um, for everything now. Um, for, fast forward 12 years or so, um, Postgres has come a long way. Um, at the start of 2013, I was, I've been living in Japan for about five years. Um, out of the blue, recruiter contacted me, asked me if I'd be interested in helping um, what they call Japan's second largest stock exchange migrate their system from Oracle to Postgres. And my first reaction was like, oh my god, it's totally, I don't know anything about finance. This is like, oh, way out, way out of my league. But I went along, had a talk with them, it, um, found out what they needed, and I ended up um, being hired for a year to assist with that migration. Um, so this is how Postgres gets onto a stock exchange. This is actually Postgres on the stock photo. But, uh, <coughs> anyway, um, so I mentioned PTS before. Um, it stands for Propriety Trading System. Um, these are alternatives to established stock exchanges which originated during the 1990s in the US mainly, um, together with the rise of electronic trading and improvements in network capabilities, capabilities. They're often associated with high frequency trading. Um, that's not uh, everything. Um, uh, they are, of course, available to institutional traders only, so you usually need to go through a broker to trade on them. Um, if you're interested in more detail on the industry, there's a book called Dark Pools by a guy called Scott Patterson, who um, does a very good job of um, describing it in a reasonable way. Okay, so the company I was working for is called SBI Japan Next. Um, it's Japan's second largest trading venue after the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and it's one of two PTSs in Japan. The other one's called ChaiX, um, which I won't go into. It was established in 2006, uh, quite a while ago, relatively speaking. Um, it's part of the SBI group, which is a largest banking group in Japan, which was originally part of um, a company called SoftBank, who's a te telecom provider. I think they also took recently took over um, Sprint in the US, but it's been spun off then and is now, now separate from um, SoftBank. It is Japan, um, they do mainly um, retail banking. They run Japan's largest online um, stock trading system which is not part of Japan Next, that's a separate business unit. Um, and currently they account for around 5% of equities, tra um, equities trading volume in Japan. Um, just to give you an idea how the business grew, um, it's a bit hard to read, but on the left is two, this is from 2010 to towards the end of 2013. So four, three, three, four years ago, they were very small. Growth didn't really kick in until um, 2013. Um, figures are a bit hard to read. On the right, the, the market share, which has steadily grown. The blue bars are market volume. Um, fortunately, the, the graph is in, was in yen. Um, 100 million yen is about one, one million US, one billion. 100 billion yen is about one billion US dollars. So um, at the end of last year, they were, they were doing between one and two billion US dollars worth of transactions a day, which may or may, may not be a large amount, <laughs> depending on your perspective. Um, since then, growth has leveled off a bit, but it's still um, in that general area. So I will explain a bit about how trading actually happens. Um, it's not like this. Um, there, there's no trading floor with people standing about shouting, waving bits of paper. Um, it's just, oops, sorry. Um, Yeah, it's 
just a bunch of servers. Um, these are in a very large data center, which is built on reclaimed land in Tokyo Bay, which also happens to be where um, Tokyo Stock Exchange has its servers and where pretty much anyone who's anyone in the finance industry keeps their servers. Um, because of the latency, of course, it's a very strange place in some ways. I mean, it's all about, um, you know, depending on where, on where your server room is located, um, if your connection goes out the wrong way, you'll, you'll be at a disadvantage compared to your competitors because your data will be going up to a mile further to reach the um, exchange service. Um, so, um, the trading flow basically works like this. We have the what's called the front <coughs> office where the actual trading takes place. That's a propriety system. Um, brought in from NASDAQ. Uh, it's all electronic, of course. Sorry about, sorry about the horrible green there. Um, it, the links, there are direct links from client systems. It's all um, internal network. It's not connected to the internet at, at all. Most, many client systems are actually co-located within the same server room, again, for um, speed latency issues. And um, what's called the matching engine, um, might sound a bit disappointing, but that's actually not database-based. Um, but it does generate a large amount of data, um, basic records of all, of all trades. Um, I think up to about 40 million records a day, or even more recently. Uh, and that's exported as CSV data to the back end, which is where the database comes into play, because it needs to be um, stored as reliably and as quickly as possible. It doesn't have to be quite real time, I and mean, there is a delay of um, a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on circumstances, but it does need to be restored reliably. And from that database, um, stuff like reporting, internal Excel reporting, um, auditing, checking for insider trading, all that kind of stuff is, um, is done there. So, and um, Previously, that database was Oracle. Um, it's now Postgres. Um, now, why would a company like that want to migrate to Postgres? Um, technically, the system, there was no compelling need to migrate. Um, Oracle's working fine. Um, however, the system, the service that we're running on, was running on, were reaching at the end of life, needed replacing. Um, market volume was picking up, which was also another reason to um, why to upgrade systems, um, and there's also a general requirement to reduce cost. Um, not that they're making a loss, but um, you know, the fi world of finance, obviously, <laughs> they are very sensitive about money. Um, and another problem was they needed to maintain not only a production environment, but also a um, testing environment for customers, which was not really a production environment, but still involved paying license fees, um, which gave some incentive to make changes there. Uh, why Postgres in particular? Well, of course, um, free is in beer. It's one factor. They also looked into other options. I think Fiber was checked, was evaluated MySQL. It was, I think, fairly quickly ruled out. MongoDB, um, there's quite a, there were quite a few people who use MongoDB, and they did actually seriously look into it. Um, incredibly enough, the, but uh, the main reason why it was rejected is because they thought they would have to rewrite all their SQL queries, which would have been too much work. Um, but even if they could have done that, I, uh, they would have had other problems. Um, they were already using Postgres in-house for internal systems like Wiki Request Tracker, so there was some familiar familiarity with it. Um, though, no, though no one actually worked with it directly. And this is um, another factor which is very important is um, you can sit there, you can look at, look at specifications, you can say, okay, this should work, this could process our data, but um, are we sure? And this is where things like case studies are very important. And this is where it gets a bit freaky, because when I was contacted by the recruiter, I had never heard of this company, so I asked among people I know in Tokyo if they knew about it, and it turned out I knew someone I knew by a forum. I didn't even know his name, I had no idea what he did. He said, oh, I know this company, come along and have a beer. So I went along and had a beer with him. It turned out um, he worked in finance, IT. He had previously deployed Postgres. He knew this company. Um, 
And he had actually recommended to the CEO, he said to the CEO, yes, I've used Postgres before, yes, it does work, yes, it's very good. And that was one factor why, why they decided to go for Postgres. Um, it's like tangent, um, why open source anyway? I mean, you might imagine finance company they have bucket loads of money to throw at um, whatever solution suits them. Um, in this case, it was a bit of a, um, again, um, Money is a slip you know, they, they want to save money, but um, the very important reason is they do not want to be vendor dependent if they can avoid it because this is a very high performance environment. You want to know your systems, um, you want to have people in house on the ground so when something goes down, you're not hanging on the phone to support. Um, so, pretty much where possible, in everything is um, open source, all servers are Linux except the Windows one. Um, lots of the workstations are Linux. Um, pretty much all the internal applications are Linux. Um, yeah, so the migration planning stuff I did around the middle of 2012, which is before I came on board, they, they set a hard deadline of 2013, which was, sounds quite short. Um, the reason was, I think around October 2013, the um, various licenses came up for re renewal. Um, they also saw it as an opportunity to refactor their existing systems, which had grown rather chaotically over the last few years. Um, so the migration schedule looks like this. It's kind of a bit hard to read. Um, just, just basically an example, it's divided into three parts. They set up Postgres, set up the schema, um, then move on to converting the application, the applications, um, which took the, um, which is what took the most time. Um, uh, luckily, for fortunately, all the applications which access the database were in-house custom applications, so they didn't, they were not um, bound to external vendors, which made the process um, a lot easier than it might have. Been otherwise have been. Also, probably um, somewhat disappointing, but the way they were using Oracle was actually fairly straightforward. So there were no big showstoppers where they said, okay, or this Oracle does this, but Postgres can't do it. Um, so the um, changeover started um, around the beginning of 2013, they imported data from Oracle, all the historical data. Um, once the um, applications had been ported, they started running um, parallel, uh, loss creation parallel to, to Oracle. So for about a month or so, um, the two systems were running in absolute parallel to sort out any as a final test. Um, and there was a lot of testing, um, really a lot of testing. Um, the switchover went like this. The par parallel um, running was in August 2013. First Monday in September 2013, uh, Postgres was switched to primary. Oracle was left running as a backup in case you know something hit the fan. Um, it would have been possible to switch back over without any data loss. Um, with a f the exception of a, a few small issues, it actually ran very smoothly. So by October, Oracle um, was switched off and its life was came to an end. Um, and since then, um, it's been run entirely on Postgres. Um, okay, a few issues encountered during the migration. Um, they're all pretty much classical Oracle issues. The, um, upper, uppercase versus lowercase was a big issue. <laughs> um, there are so many scripts. Um, I mean, they use a whole mix of, mix of Perl, Ruby, Python, and PHP, and there's all so many places where the assumption was, okay, 
column names, they will be coming up a case. Um, that's, you know, it's not insurmountable. It just takes time to go through everything and um, <coughs> either change it or ensure that um, it's not an issue. Um, another classical problem is null versus empty string. We all know Oracle has a um, slight some issues with uh, nulls. Um, which was a problem because the um, when importing um, data from Oracle, um, in quite a few places they forgot to convert empty strings to null, which meant there was um, a couple of weekends in the summer where we had to go in and do everything from scratch again. So that did inspire me actually to send in a patch to improve um, copy from, which would have been very useful at the time. Um, Another big problem is, um, and it is an issue which probably um, occurred because no one, when the um, conversion began, no one had any particular Postgres experience. That was before I came on board, and they had basically done a very simplistic conversion of the, the Oracle schema to Postgres. Um, which is gives you quite um, which produces some inefficiencies if you have very large data sets for example in Oracle the date um, data type is actually a timestamp um, and in many cases they were storing the date not the time but this was in, in Postgres they actually converted it to a timestamp so you had these very large tables where the only date, date was being stored which um, where, they, where they could have used a four-byte date column, but they were using an eight-byte um, timestamp column, um, which doesn't sound a lot, but <coughs> when you're dealing with um, very big tables, um, I think I mentioned before they, the daily, tra ta daily trading data table um, is being filled with about 40 million rows. Uh, it does tend to add up. Um, Anyway, so, um, yeah, SQL state, there are a lot of queries which needed to be converted. Um, again, nothing insurmountable is, uh, problem is, uh, um, there are a lot of cases where queries which ran fine on Oracle when they were dropped into Postgres, the, the, in Oracle, they were running in less than a minute, for example, even over very large data sets in Postgres. Um, as is, they were taking several orders of magnitude longer, um, which was a problem because the, um, I think I probably didn't mention it before, but there was some internal resistance to moving to Postgres because the DBAs were mainly Oracle people and they were using, they were seeing, oh my God, our queries are taking so much, so much longer now. This is Postgres sucks. Um, but there was actually nothing which couldn't be resolved by rewriting the queries. Uh, um, I think CTA has helped a lot with that. Um, stored procedure conversion, that was also um, a bit tricky sometimes. Um, there was... Um, is a recommendation in the Postgres docs that if you use or Oracle's package level variables, you can simulate them using temporary tables. So someone obviously read that and did implemented some um, quite critical procedures, which then went on to create um, vast um, some a very expensive temporary tables every time they run. Um, okay. Um, configuration tuning, I mean, when I got there, they were still using the default um, configuration, 128 megabytes um, shared buffers on a 64 gigabyte system. Uh, that was something to um, fix. And 
one problem, if you remember the mailings of old, they came with the advice, don't kill Dash 9 the Postmaster. Um, for their HA solution, they used in-house um, paired service clusters running DRDB and um, HP service guard software. And when you fail over service guard, if the applications don't shut down cleanly within a certain time, service guard was just shooting them down, which no, I wasn't aware of, no one else was aware of, but it turned out that uh, after failing over, um, Postgres was being killed, the Postgres was being killed off like that, and we were getting index corruption. Um, again, that was something else which was solvable. Um, going back to the data types, I can... It's 2014, I still fail to understand why other database systems do not have a Boolean. Um, there's a right way of doing it, and there's a wrong way of doing it, and you'd be surprised how many different ways there are to express Boolean. <laughs> um, no, um, well, like I said, I mean, the original plan with this migration was to tidy or to consolidate all these systems, clean them up a bit. Unfortunately, uh, as things are, you know, the way things go, didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would like to have done it, but it's just, um, you got to say, let's see. Do it later. So, um, unfortunately, I can't give too much detail out about the systems. Um, as of the March 2014, the daily production database, which can, contains the data from the last 12 months or so, was about two terabytes. It, there were 40 million rows being inserted each trading session, uh, and it's growing by 15 to 20 gigabytes daily. Um, they also have a requirement to archive all data for about um, 10 years, and it's going to a data warehouse which is uh, about 8 terabytes. So that's a separate database. Um, yeah, so after my, you know, once the initial migration was completed, there was still quite a lot to do. Uh, if you would go in there now, you'd look at the code, you'd look at the queries, you'd still think, ah, this was an Oracle database, you know, like with, with the um, Boolean. So there would be a lot more which could be done, especially with the data type and schema optimization. That is something I think um, which should have been done at the start, but no one really was really thinking about it. Um, import speed, the, we were dealing with 40 million rows a day. Um, Postgres and packed that away, no problem. Um, the issue was, start, however, starting to occur if you have high frequency trading, sometimes you get bursts of transactions, which tend to happen towards the end of the trading day. So um, it was starting to lag, and we ended up having to um, create um, a very customized solution for that. Um, Backups, again, there were a slight problem because we were um, taking base backup, base backups at the week, each weekend, and it was taking um, more than a day to do. And it was actually the backup was got to the point where the backup was still running while trading was happening, which is was fine, but it's not um, something to do. You want to have happy in the long term. Um, and the other problem is, like I said, we had this, had this huge data warehouse um, getting tricky to run some sort of some queries on it. Um, they were starting to look at uh, other solutions, including some, um, putting the data into something like um, C store and accessing that through a foreign data wrapper. Um, Yeah, common complaints and requests that came up a lot. Select count asterisks, common one. You know, we all know <laughs> about that. Um, partitioning, they also use partitioning quite a lot. It's, um, it works, but um, they were interested in more um, comfortable solutions. They also made um, a lot of use of quite complex views. Uh, and the problem is in Postgres, of course, the um, view source is not stored, so they were 
actually defining the view installer procedures um, and execu executing from that. Um, upgrades were also something they weren't sure about. Um, they're running 9.2. They would have liked to have upgraded to 9.3 at some point, but um, yeah. Um, No, we weren't sure how the best way of going about that. And the other, the other issue is um, parallel queries. You, know, you see a lot, you know, big queries, you have big, 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 big servers, do it w idle except for the one query just occupying one processor. Um, okay, uh, conclusions. Um, I mean, my take one big takeaway is Yeah. I mean, because you have downtime for Oracle too, right? Probably, yeah. Well, it wasn't some complaints as much, so as much as it's just um, no one was at that point was sure how the procedure would go, what the best way of going about it would be. Um, that is. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the um, the HA was done, was um, implemented, like I said, with um, the RDB and HP Service Guard. Um, fortunately, this is not 24-7 operation. It only needs to be working during trading hours, so we, there were some windows for uh, maintenance. Um, yeah. So, like I said, I mean, there were quite a few problems which came up because they started the migration without much Postgres specific knowledge. So, if someone is doing that, then they do need to get someone on board who knows about Postgres to make sure you don't end up pinning yourself into a corner. Um, ideally, you shouldn't, you should not be converting from Oracle but to Postgres. Um, one, actually, one aim of the, one of the other aim of the pro process was to make the system database as database neutral as possible. So, if in the future you know, maybe they decided they didn't, they didn't like Postgres anymore, it would be less tricky to move to something else. Um, also, maybe an opportunity to refactor systems, like I said, didn't really happen. Um, yeah, and basically you should treat migration as an investment, which may cost more in the short term. Um, it's not just a pure cost-saving opportunity. Okay, I think we're running out of time now. So, um, in Japan, after such a lecture, it's traditional to say "Gosaichu um, arigato gozaimashita," which is Japanese for "Thank you, not thank you for not falling asleep." <laughs> 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 yeah. And one final word from um, my boss. He said, um, "Second contract is hiring. If anyone <laughs> interested, then contact us." Um, oh, you just went, they were just using the normal Postgres sequences. It wasn't. Oh, but I mean, in yeah. other words, like, did you, because like in Oracle, you have, a, yeah. you have a sequence and then you have a trigger and yeah. you can do the same thing in Postgres, but maybe the, or, you know, you can do it the default value is the sequence yeah. that next value. What, what did you all want to do? Is that what you think? Yeah, they, they just went, ended up with, they ended up doing the, um, you know, the sequence for the default value. Yeah, that's not. Yes, to a certain 
Yeah, that, that I did. I do. Yeah. Um, like I said, there was one. I think there's only one procedure where, where that was actually an issue. Um, uh, the they actually initially converted it using temporary tables, um, but I actually looked at that, and what they should have done is um, they, they didn't actually need to do that. It was actually possible to uh, rewrite the function in another way. So it was it's ba it was basically calculating some data from um, another table, which we could have done by putting triggers on that table and keep um, making that table globally available. Um, don't think so, no. Like I said, I mean, the slightly boring to say, but the Oracle scheme was fairly simplistic. Um, so unfortunately, there aren't m too many um, problems to report or interesting solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? It was 10G. 10G? Yeah. Plus 9.2. Yeah. Yeah. over um, partition tables, and they were producing, as is, they were producing very um, inefficient plans um, in Postgres. Uh, with lot, you know, I think there were lots of drawings, I have queries involved in them. I, I don't, I don't have any um, to hand at the moment. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was a pain. And uh, did you change the, the data model at all? Like, I mean, you know, the large sets of data were different, or was it the same exact? It, uh, it was pretty much the same. Like I said, I mean, um, I was a bit surprised. It was a, quite a simplistic data model. It's basically a, a data warehouse with a bunch of tables that they dump data in. Yeah. Um, when I arrived, they only had one foreign key. It was a. Um, Anyone?